Good day. My name is Jeroen van den Hoven. I'm a full professor at Delft University of Technology, where I teach in ethics and technology in a philosophy uh, group. And I'm also an advisor to the European Commission in the European Group uh, on Ethics. And we're advising uh, the president, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, on new technologies and um, the ethical and societal dimensions of them. Um, I want to discuss three important points um, uh, with you when you are thinking about leading ethically in the 21st century, uh, an age of digital technologies and high technology, more generally speaking. Um, I don't consider them to be sufficient conditions for ethical leadership, but I think there are necessary conditions and anyone who would claim to be leading ethically or wants to be recognized as, as an ethical leader, I think will have to somehow embody or exemplify these three core ideas in some form or other. Um, the first idea um, is the idea that um, um, one needs to um, apply one's ethics, one's principles, one's values to the work at hand, to the new technology, to the innovation, and one needs to bring them to bear effectively, productively on, um, uh, on the work. So three core ideas under this label I would like to uh, discuss with you. And the first is that, and it's trivial, trivial but it, it is important to, to point out. Um, and that is that technology is not neutral. It is not value neutral, it contains and has embedded and expressed in it the ideas of, of its maker, the one who thought about it. And the textbook example is Langdon Winner's Low Hanging Over Passes. He already wrote about this in, in the 80s of the previous century. And um, there is some discussion about whether it's hist historically accurate, but there are so many examples that uh, that make the same point that um, uh, that we could run with it for for the for this occasion. Uh, it it illustrates the, a point makes this point very clearly that these overpasses in New York you can still see them were designed uh, so low as to prevent buses from the poor black neighborhoods to be routed to the white middle class beaches. So a piece of steel and concrete, a simple piece of civil engineering has expressed and embedded in it a racist idea. Um, so from the, the drawing board, it, it has further downstream consequences for people who live in a city. And it's, it's racist. And we know that once you've seen this and, and you appreciate it, you will see many, many examples around you. And, uh, and the, uh, the history of science and technology is full with these examples. More recently, of course, uh, they present themselves in the form of, of algorithms and bias of AI and machine learning uh, that discriminate against certain groups or, or recommender systems that divide and, um, and increase tensions in societies or websites that are made intentionally addictive or park benches that are designed in such a way that people are prevented to sleep on them. So this is called hostile architecture. So these ideas, these ideologies are are designed in, um, and Churchill uh, once said, and he was very right, and, um, and we should be reminded of, of that nice saying, uh, first we shape our houses and then our houses shape us. We make the technology, we live in it, and we inherit some of the properties that we, uh, that we gave um, to our artifacts. And um, we should, should be thinking of that. The second idea under this label of designing for values or, or, or making your values or your ethics concrete in the context of innovation and new technologies is the fact that our values themselves in our day and age are design consequential. When you are, you know, think you, that privacy is very important or human dignity or democracy, or whatever value you cherish, um, then in a, um, a context of high technology where everything is designed, you should be willing, prepared and able to spell out how it will have to be implemented 
So, for example, if you're a director of a, of a hospital and you are you think privacy is very important, then when you're thinking about a new system, hospital information system, um, I expect you to um, you know, to be very concrete with respect to the privacy requirements for that new system. So, and if you don't, and if you're not willing or not able to do that, then it becomes a little bit gratuitous to speak about privacy. And the same for democracy and the same for human dignity. So we co we're confronted on a day-to-day -day basis with uh, new design challenges, and uh, we are expected to be able to translate our values into requirements so that we can check whether they are effectively embedded and incorporated. Not like the, 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 the racist uh, um, overpasses, but uh, hopefully um, uh, with respect to the values that we share that were implemented in the right way in the technology. Um, so uh, the third idea is then uh, under this level of designing for values is, is that we need a methodology to do this, to do this demonstrably, accountably, uh, recurrently and in an agile way so that others can, you know, criticize us, that we can can be held to account for that process so that it becomes a little bit like uh, a democratic procedure. Uh, and it's not, and the values are not, uh, it's kind of sneaked into artifacts and, and architecture uh, in the way that was uh, illustrated by um, the example I gave of the low-hanging overpasses. So we need a method, we need tools, we need um, an ability to do this on a day-to-day -day basis. So designing for values becomes something that is, is part and parcel of leading uh, high-tech organizations uh, and dealing effectively and responsibly with um, technology. Um, the other idea, so the second idea, so th this was about um, bringing your values uh, to bear upon the work um, that you're doing or the work that people are doing in your, in your organization. The second idea is of innovating responsibly. Um, and one important uh, thing um, that we should realize is that the first part I talked about is designing for values is people could design for all kinds of values. People could design for Nazi values or for values that make people addicted to websites or to smartphones or to... Um, so it's important to be able to spell out those values, but we want to proceed responsibly. This means that we need to include a lot of stakeholders that all represent different value perspectives and we have to have them at the right moment early on in the process around the table so that they can express what they think is important. And out of all of these different perspectives, we need to somehow distill and arrive at a shared conception of how our innovations and our novelties should be shaped. Um, so that is an important uh, aspect of uh, responsible innovation is inclusion of radically different value perspectives that we then try to honor and respect in, uh, in concrete cases. The other thing is, is that we need to proceed in such a way that we don't make it impossible for others to hold us responsible. Uh, we should not make it uh, impossible that we feel responsible or that others feel responsible. So while proceeding with innovations, with technology, with managing, with steering organizations and guiding people, we have at the same time try to optimize the conditions for responsibility. That's a separate task. Responsibility in our day and age is not something that just happens. It is something that needs to be designed for. We need to design institutions and mechanisms and processes and procedures that will optimize the conditions for responsibility. So that's another idea in responsible innovation. And there is someone who is responsible for making <laughs> that the case. So that's a higher order responsibility, if you want, and that's typically a management responsibility or the responsibility of the CEO or the board of trustees to make sure that everything is in place so that responsibility can actually uh, take place. Um, a third idea um, that I would like to highlight is the idea that uh, all of this takes place in a systems context. And it's not just a component or this little thing or the algorithm or the valve or the tube or the cable that you need to work on. It is, it is 
all set in a systems context, sometimes referred to as a systems of systems context, uh, and very often a global context. And we need to appreciate that. I'll give you an example of how that works. For example, if you ask, is nuclear power uh, a safe um, you know, mode of, of energy production? Um, well, people tend to think and zoom in right away on uh, you know, the, the cooling liquid or the concrete or the lead slabs or the, the thick uh, walls. But that's for sure a very important component of the safety. Um, but the remuneration and the training of the security uh, personnel or the calibration of the Geiger counter or the integrity of the supply chains of the nuclear material or the um, inspection mechanisms and the governance and the laws that pertain to nuclear energy production um, are equally important. And if they are not you know, taken care of um, in, in, in a good way, then the whole system will fail. It is as strong as the weakest link and everything needs to be uh, seen in that uh, systems context. Otherwise, it will just not work. The other another example is if you think about the self-driving car, um, you know, people tend to focus on the AI and the sensors and will it be able to detect people who are uh, crossing the street, etc., and identify them correctly. That's one thing. But you also have to think about insurance mechanisms for self-driving cars and the liability schemes and uh, what does a driver's license look like? Um, how do we certify these cars? How do we maintain them? Uh, what needs to change there? Um, how about the psychology of people who are sitting on the back seat and reading a newspaper? Or will they be able to intervene adequately when that is needed? Um, so the self-driving car is a nice idea but there is an, an incredible um, uh, amount of, of things that you need to be, uh, be thinking of, and you need to think of them uh, in their interconnections and interdependencies. So that requires interdisciplinary work, not only ethics, but also law and psychology and AI and um, you know, automotive uh, industry, hardcore uh, technologies, and they need to be brought um, uh, into, uh, uh, into uh, uh, relation uh, with each other. So um, these are the things I think um, need to be uh, need to be dealt with if you are um, thinking about leading ethically responsibly um, in the 21st century. And I think you will see um, that this can also generate trust because trust is a moral phenomena. It's not about your competence or your expertise. It is about um, are you willing and prepared and able to take the moral point of view? And these three ingredients, the designing for value, so being very explicit with, your, with, with respect to your, what your values mean in a, te a technological context and being able to spell out what they mean in terms of the requirements, then the responsible innovation, that is the designing for your responsibility and trying to uh, combine values in a smart way. And the third thing, being able to see the bigger systematic context are ways to illustrate, to signal, to communicate to consumers, to others around you, to society at large, that you are taking your ethics seriously. And that will be rewarded with trust and a license to operate. And I think that is, um, that is very important to realize. Thank you.